All right, so my name is Caitlin. I'm an AmeriCorps member with the Nevada Par uh, Department of Wildlife. And with me is Julie Watson, and she is our wonderful wildlife education coordinator. And she'll be answering any questions and just moderating the chat and everything for me tonight. And uh, with that being said, this is a family program. So uh, if you put anything in the chat, um, when I do open it up, just please be aware uh, that we could have children watching or just people of various different backgrounds. So please be respectful and anyone who is not being uh, respectful in the Q&A or the chat will have to either be muted or uh, removed from the live stream. So with that being said, let's get started. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. So this is going to be Nevada birding for beginners. So regardless of your birding experience, uh, there are lots of different um, things you can learn from today's uh, you know, webinar. So real quick, I'm gonna start off by asking a question. Um, so I want to understand what the different kind of levels of birding experience that people have. So uh, go ahead and just answer real quick what kind of experience you have birding. Uh, it could be none, some, intermediate or veteran. Awesome. So we're getting a lot of kind of beginners, um, people who maybe have some knowledge but want to learn more. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm really glad that a lot of new people are tuning in today to kind of learn a little bit more about how to become a better birder and I guess what to look for. Okay, awesome. So Regardless if you're a birder, um, you know, beginner or a veteran, there's plenty to learn today. So to start off, we're just going to talk real quick about where we can find birds. So birds are pretty much everywhere you look. Um, it's just about uh, paying attention. So you need to make sure that wherever you're going, that you're paying attention to the world around you. And definitely when I started birding, I became more aware of what was in my environment. Uh, you start to notice things you might have not have noticed before. Maybe you start to notice the type of trees in your neighborhood that the birds like to hang out in, or you start to notice the changes around you. Um, you know, as the seasons change, you notice which birds come through. So uh, the key is definitely to pay attention 100%. Um, and this also means that bird watching can be done anywhere, which is excellent because you don't need to be in a specific area. Um, anyone can go bird watching, whether you're in a parking lot or a state reserve um, or some you know, beautiful place to just your backyard. So it doesn't really matter uh, where you start your birding journey as long as you just get out and try to start it. And with that being said, birds are actually found on all seven continents. So they are very, um, able to live pretty much anywhere. We even get them in the Antarctic. Uh, there are penguins and lots of other uh, oceanic birds that will sometimes move down there as well. You can see them even in the driest parts of the desert. Uh, they are found all over the world. And uh, some of the best places to go and look for them include refuges, state trails, parks. Um, those are all great uh, places to find different species. And if you live in Nevada, I'm sure there might be some people joining us from, um, you know, different areas, uh, California or surrounding states. But um, with that being said, there's lots of different areas to go in the state of Nevada. One place I love to go is Pyramid Lake, where we have the island that is up there. Uh, there's a wildlife reserve on the island in Pyramid Lake. Um, and then I've also been down south to the southern part of the state. Ash Meadows is my favorite area down there. Uh, and I've seen lots of amazing birds uh, during my time down there as well. So there's lots of different places to go and there's lots of great groups that you can join that will tell you some good places to go as well. All right, so there are lots of health benefits to birding. I love to tell people this all the time that it gets you outdoors and that's pretty much the biggest thing uh, for everyone. Uh, we're all stuck inside right now and especially with COVID and everything going on, it's better to get away from your screen, away from sitting in front of your computer all day or just locked inside. Uh, you can definitely do this and be isolated or just with one or two people. And this is great because it promotes your physical health and being outdoors also has a strong correlation with physical activity and promotes exercise. So uh, when you're outside doing birding, you're gonna be uh, going up mountains, you're going to be going down valleys everywhere. Um, even if you're just taking a walk to your local park, there's going to be tons of opportunities to get outside and take a walk. 
if um, if you're really trying to make a habit of birding, I would even try to do this every day or even just once a week. Uh, just getting out, taking a 20, 30 minute walk around your neighborhood and seeing what's out there. Um, in addition, it's really great for mental health. Um, like I said, back with the whole COVID and being in front of your computer, um, definitely great to get out and kind of take a break from that. It's really good to change your scenery up to take a breath of fresh air and just kind of get your mind off of things. Maybe leave your phone at home unless you wanna use it to take pictures or to look up birds um, or just put it on do not disturb. Just try to go out and walk around um, without those distractions and just kind of take in everything that's going on around you. In addition, uh, this has actually been heavily tied to ecotherapy. So um, ecotherapy is kind of a new emerging um, form of therapy. Not that it hasn't always been a thing, we've always been encouraged to go out and enjoy the outdoors, but especially the more that it seems that we are tied to inside and to our technology, um, ecotherapy has been encouraged uh, for a lot of uh, mental health patients or just anyone who might be struggling with their mental health to uh, go outside and you know enjoy the world around us. So there are tons of health benefits of birding. And with that being said, I'm sure you are ready all just to go right out and start birding because um, you know the change of scenery is definitely really nice. And before you do that, we always have to remember a code of birding ethics. So this covers a couple different things and this was developed by the American Birding Association. And what they say is that we always need to respect and promote birds and their environment. So that's just one aspect of uh, the code of birding ethics and it's incredibly important. So when you're out in the field, there's a couple different things you can do. So number one, you need to avoid in unintentionally stressing out these birds. And that could be anything from just respecting their space to uh, respecting you know, where they might you know, nest or have their feeding grounds at where they like to rest. So do not try to approach birds. Do not try to um, get too close to them or to interfere with something that they might be doing. And also minimize the habitat disturbance. So when you are going to look for, um, you know, birds are just out on the trails or doing whatever you need to do, just make sure you're staying on the trails, keeping your dog's leash, making sure not to step in their um, areas. So a lot of birds actually do nest on the ground or in low lying bushes and trees. So just make sure you're not running through those trees and bushes and causing a mess or, you know, creating destruction in those habitats is definitely something that uh, is not going to be good for them. Also, we want to be respectful on our own property. So when we're on our own property, whether it be our backyard, front yard, you know, you're just around your house. Um, sometimes you might see some little residents coming by and hanging out. So we, that's great, honestly. I love seeing uh, wildlife come up into uh, a person's backyard and just really enjoying it. They feel at home there. And you should be considered lucky that you want all these wildlife in your area, unless you're one of those people who might consider it a nuisance and that's a little different. But I think it's really awesome. So uh, one way that you can attract birds and be bird friendly in your neighborhood and in your backyard is to use native plants in your landscaping. Um, so this prevents invasive species from coming in and also preventing window strikes. So uh, there are a couple of different ways that we can do that. Actually, I know that uh, there are some sites that sell this um, material that you put on your window. And although you can't really see anything on the other side, the bird can um, kind of tell that it's a window instead of it being like just a straight reflection and they try to go through it. So it keeps them from wanting to run into your window, which is actually pretty interesting. And then the other thing is that if you have a cat or just, I guess, if you have dogs that like to chase after birds, uh, just try to keep them inside as much as possible unless you have them supervised, just to make sure that our birds don't get used to a predator being there. Um, and then they get uncomfortable and they don't want to show up. So that's another thing as well. And that's one of our friendly cat friends uh, just checking out one of the bird feeders or bird houses. So um, they will definitely get up to some mischief if you have your cat out unsupervised messing with birds. Um, the other part of birding ethics is uh, interacting with the other members of the birding community. So we do want to respect and promote the birding community and its members. So I like to bring up the term gatekeeping. Um, we try not to gatekeep the birding community because number one, um, 
you know, just because someone might not have as much skill or they, you know, haven't heard about it as long as you doesn't mean they can't also enjoy this wonderful hobby. Um, so gatekeeping is pretty much when you just tell someone, uh, I don't really want to tell you about my birding group. I don't want to take you birding with me. I don't want to. Uh, I don't think you should belong in this birding group or I don't think you should be doing it. Uh, don't do that because that just really breathes negative energy within the birding community and you don't want that. Um, also, just make sure you're sharing your observations freely. Um, I would say that 98 to 99% of the birders I've come across are super respectful of the environment and of the birds that they interact with. And I can guarantee you that if you are respectful and tell them about your observations, where you found a bird, uh, what time of day you found it, and what kind of bird it was, you know, they'll hopefully just go out and they just want to see it as well. They're not gonna, um, they're not gonna just go and crowd it, and they're not gonna be irresponsible. So they respect the environment as well. Also, you want to educate other birders positively on ethical bird watching. Um, if you believe that someone is doing something that might be unethical, it'd be good to just kind of take a step back and let them see what, what exactly they're doing wrong in a way that's positive um, so they don't like, you know, get upset about it. That's uh, just the best way to do it. Um, and also respect one another's skill level and experience. So there's going to be a lot of different skill levels. As we saw, most people here are beginner or maybe only know a little bit, and that's totally fine. Um, you know, if you are a beginner, it's great to ask someone who is already maybe a more advanced birder or a veteran, uh, you know, maybe ask them if you can go out with them sometime um, and check out some birds. I can assure you that most people I know would uh, love to do that. If you ask me, I would love to go with you as well. So that's another thing too. Okay, and then the other thing too is to respect the laws. So we do have quite a few laws uh, that are in place to protect our birds. So we need to respect and promote those laws as well. And that's going to include uh, the laws of other people as well. So the rights of other people and their property. So if you see a bird on private property, um, try to be respectful. It looks kind of weird if you're just, you know, with your binoculars staring into someone's window um, to try to see through their backyard. Uh, if you want to, you can respectfully ask them if you can go and maybe take a picture of a bird or something. I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt to try to do that, but I would say just try to be incredibly respectful of private property and landowner permission. Also, uh, familiarize yourself with the laws, rules, and regulations, and that's why I'm here to tell you exactly what those are. So we do have the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act makes it illegal to take, possess, import, uh, export, sell or purchase any migratory bird or its parts. Um, and that pretty much covers a huge number of birds in North America. Um, and this can be small things like a nest, eggs, feathers, et cetera. Um, I hear a lot of people say, well, I just found this feather on the ground, so can I just take it home? The whole thing about that is that uh, someone who might see you with that feather doesn't know if you found it on the ground or if you found it, uh, if you plucked it off of a bird. So they just kind of grouped it all together. It doesn't matter if you found it on the ground or what. So it's always important to make sure you're respecting those laws as well. There are some exceptions with certain permits, but you do have to look at your local laws to see what those are. Uh, for example, there are some religious permits that allow you, if you're a Native American or if you have a religious um, use of the feathers that you can collect them for religious uses only. Um, or if you are, you know, have a permit to trap a certain bird for falconry, then you could do that as well, or hunting. That's another thing. All right, so now we're going to kind of get into the fun stuff. So how to spot a bird. Um, this is something that, you know, you can just use in your daily life when you're just walking around uh, or you're just going to the store or whatever. So the first thing is you need to stop. So stop what you're doing. Um, if you hear a noise, especially just kind of stop you know, be quiet, try to be patient. You're going to look around. Uh, so you can look above you, around you, um, and look for little things, like look for branches moving, look for, you know, footsteps or things that are tossed over, just evidence of animals being around. And this just covers wildlife viewing in general. It doesn't have to be birding also, um, but it covers everything. So wildlife, birds, etc. You're also going to want to listen. So we're gonna listen to what's going on. Um, just kind of uh, listen for not only bird sounds and bird calls, but also, you know, twigs snapping, uh, leaves rustling. Uh, there's lots of different ways that birds kind of give hints that they're around. And the nice thing about birds is that they're usually very vocal and they're easy to find. They want to be known and they're very out there about things. So 
and then you're going to repeat this process. So um, whenever I'm at work and I'm going to the park, I'll just be walking and kind of like if I hear a noise, I'll stop, look and listen and I'll look around and look for what I'm trying to find. And then if I can't hear it anymore, I'll, I'll just uh, continue and I'll continue to be observant and walk around. So we have a few ways to identify our birds. Um, the first one I'll talk about is field marks. So a field mark is a visible mark or a characteristic. And with that, uh, we're going to talk about the mallard first. So this is a great example of a bird that pretty much everybody knows. Um, I would hope that everyone would know what a mallard is. It's our most common duck in North America. And the mallard has a shiny green head, which is super identifiable. And it has a white uh, ring around its neck as well. And that noticeable yellow bill. So that's going to be very obvious um, right off the bat. If you can't really identify it based on that, like say the duck has its head in the water, we also have that curly central tail feather in the very back, as you can see, it's right over here. And then they also have sometimes a shiny blue patch that will be on the wings um, that's easy to identify if they're flying away. So these are what we call looking for field marks. And there's also a number of field marks on the face that are pretty important to remember too. So um, just a couple ones I'll go over is going from the top to the bottom. We have the crown stripe, so that's going to be on the top of the head. And it could be a stripe or it could be the whole top of their head. That's considered the crown. Then you have the eyebrow stripe, which is usually going to be just above their eyes. And the eye line, which is going to be extending out from their eyes. So it's kind of going to look like, um, you know, math, uh, like eyeliner for a bird, I guess. It would be kind of funny way to put it. Um, in addition, you have the lore, which is going to be in front of the eyes, and sometimes this takes on crazy colors. Also, the whisker mark, uh, those are also pretty notable as well. They look like a mustache. And then we have the throat patch and the mandibles. So the mandibles are going to just be the beak um, and whatever color that they are. Usually, they're not too crazy colors, but some uh, birds do have some pretty, pretty crazy colors with the mandibles as well. And one good way to kind of check these out is to have binoculars. And they're a great tool for looking at birds very up close in HD. And like I said before, if you don't have binoculars, uh, try to find a friend that you know that birds a lot, or maybe just has them, a hunting friend or something, and ask respectfully if you can borrow them or if you can go out birding with them. Um, because I do think binoculars are super essential to becoming a good birder. Um, and also just uh, to really enjoy the hobby a lot more. And um, another way that we identify our birds is by size and shape. And uh, size and shape definitely does really matter uh, because you can identify by family as well. And I won't really talk about that here, but there are some future webinars that might discuss the different types of families of birds and how they are different from one another. So the first one is to infer the size of the mystery bird by using um, a reference to birds that you're familiar with. So um, a lot of bird species are gonna be shaped similarly to others. Um, so for example, the house sparrow is probably the smallest one that looks just like a, a robin and a crow. They have that very thin beak, um, the kind of tail feathers that extend outwards, and they have the same kind of up, um, upward position when they're uh, walking around on the ground. So they look very similar. Um, if you're just looking at a picture or you're looking through binoculars and you don't really have a good reference point to how big they are. Um, but I like to use this reference point, which is the sparrow robin crow goose chart. Um, and I actually got that from Merlin Bird ID, which is one of the apps I use. And um, when identifying a bird, they're going to ask you, okay, well, what's the size is it between a sparrow and a robin or a robin and a crow or a crow and a goose? So those are some common uh, birds you can compare to uh, when you're out birding because they are just very common birds in general. So another way to identify is by behavior. And a lot of these birds are going to be uh, pretty obvious based on their family. They're gonna behave a certain way, but also where they live and what they do. So um, for example, um, an American Dipper is one of our water birds. It's gonna hang out near the water and it'll kind of dip and beg, uh, bend its legs every so often. And a lot of the times when I've seen these birds, they'll be on a rock in the middle of the river or just like right next to the river. So um, if you wanted to find this bird, for example, you'd probably go to the river to find it. And then we also have like the European starlings, uh, which fly together in formations called murmurs. And this is what the European starling looks like. Um, you probably heard them. They're very vocal and social birds. 
Um, and they generally like to hang out on uh, telephone wires and they're generalists. So you'll see them out in a lot of different places. And uh, they have this starry coloration on them, which is very uh, eye-catching. So it's pretty cool when you do see a starling, although they're pretty common. All right, and then another way we can identify is by time and location. And when I say this, I'm referring to the time of the year and the location based on their migratory schedules. So um, a lot of birds are gonna be migratory. They'll leave their spring and breeding locations uh, for places that might be more abundant with food uh, for the winter. So right now, for example, we are in the middle of, or we're actually just about to start the winter migration. So a lot of birds will be coming down from Canada or the northern states, and Nevada is actually a really good corridor for a lot of the birds to come down through. So they'll come down uh, through the south, through Nevada, um, and this is a good time to see a lot of those birds migrating from the north to the south. In addition, um, they're going to occupy different habitats. Uh, so when you're checking out your birds, you want to make sure that they're in the habitat that they're supposed to be in. So fish eating birds are going to be found near the sources of water. Um, and then also birds that might be more of hunters or prey, they might be found more higher in the air or um, in the meadows looking for easy prey or something like that. All right. So another way to identify is by sounds and songs. And I like this too, because it's really fun to kind of quiz yourself on the different kinds of sounds and songs that you have. And if a bird is calling, you can identify it without ever having to even see it. I do this all the time. And it can also lead you to where the bird is located. So um, for example, one thing that I like to do on my phone is uh, certain apps actually play uh, the sound back for you. Uh, for calls, um, you can look up the bird that you're looking for and it'll play back the sound. So you can play it and a lot of birds will actually come up and try to compete with the sound. So it kind of makes them a little bit more obvious. And this can be really helpful for elusive birds. Um, and if they're hiding or if they're kind of hard to see, uh, you want them to kind of come out a little bit more, then you can find them or you can just hear them a little bit better as well. And it's good for birds with similar appearances like the sparrow. Um, these are two sparrows that we have uh, that have a little bit of a similar appearance, but they're different with their sound. So I'll play one sound for you. So this is the brewer sparrow. Awesome. So that one kind of has more of a fluttery tune. And then this one is the Lincoln Sparrow. So that one has more of a kind of a scratchy sound, but you'll be able to tell the difference um, just by looking up those birds. And you can look through a different uh, number of different sparrows and kind of figure out uh, which one it matches up with best. Another one that I really love, um, whose sound that I hear often, but I don't always see, is the meadowlark. And so those ones like to hang out in, um, you know, fields and stuff like that, but they're awesome. I love hearing them. So we're going to do a quick activity now that we've kind of been able to identify our birds a little bit better. We're going to test your knowledge as birders. So this is a little bit of an easy way to kind of uh, check what you're looking for before you even go out. So uh, we're going to use the size, the field markings, location, behavior, and the shape to figure out this bird. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a bird and in the chat, feel free to list off some descriptions of this bird and then we'll kind of go over it together and name the bird. If you do know the bird, just hold on for a minute um, and don't quite answer it right away because we're going to go over it together. All right, so this bird is first. And let me open up the chat to everyone. So there we go. It should work now. All right, so larger than a crow, absolutely. It is going to be larger than a crow. Yeah, the beak shape is definitely unique. Yeah, has webbed feet, absolutely. All 
All right, so we'll go over this one together now. So this one is, yeah, larger than a goose or goose size. Um, and it's going to have that black color all over. This one was a pretty easy one. Um, it'll be sunning and hanging out near the water. So that's something that cormorants love to do. Uh, I just gave it away, it's cormorant. Um, but notable markings include the orange cheeks and beak, and then also that long neck that uh, is very uh, consistent with water birds. And so this one is going to be the double crested cormorant. Awesome. So this is our next one. This one might be a little obvious, but like I said, just uh, try to hold on if you can identify it and just kind of wait until um, everyone's kind of put in some answers. So what are some things about our um, this bird that would be notable? Yeah, size of a robin for sure. The white circle around the eye, so the white eye ring, absolutely. It's perching in the trees. It's got that breast, that red breast, absolutely. Okay, so this one's going to be, I just said starling size because I didn't want to give it away, but it is a robin. Um, it's a black gray coloration. And it's got that rufous breast and white eye ring. So one thing I kind of failed to mention was that rufous is a color that a lot of wildlifers like to use for birds specifically. Um, it's like an orangey brown color. Um, so robins are a great example of a rufous color because they've got that rufousy colored breast. And they also will be hanging out in the trees and on the ground. So yes, that was an American robin, absolutely. All right, next one. This one might be a little bit more of a challenge. So yeah, some notable um, field marks on this one. So yeah, that white eyebrow. Got the long beak, um, a distinctive tail, definitely. Upturned tail, uh, like a gray mandible. Absolutely, lots of great responses. I'm so glad people are participating with this. Awesome. Um, so we got the sparrow size. Uh, so it's pretty small. It's about a little bit bigger than a sparrow. Um, it's going to be a gray and brown coloration and has those barred tail feathers on the very back and the um, white eyebrow stripe as well. And then it's also gonna be hanging out in trees. Uh, that's usually where it is. It's kind of one of those more hidden birds that likes to hang out in bushes or just in the way back of trees. Uh, so they are a little bit more hidden, but very vocal. And they also have a long thin beak and fluttery tail. And this is going to be a Buick's wren. And the cool thing about Buick's wren is that all the wrens are very similar like this. They have that long beak and a very noticeable uh, flippy tail that flips up and down whenever they're running around. Uh, so wrens are very easy to identify um, for the family, but the individual wrens are a little bit harder to identify for the species. <clears throat> All right, so this one might be a little easy for some people, but um, we'll do this one next. Yeah, it's about the size of a goose. It's got that white color. Long beak, yeah, absolutely. It's in a body of water. Yeah, it's near water, so definitely using its behavior. Some very great responses. So that being said, uh, it's larger than a goose. Uh, so um, these are pretty big birds. Um, they have white and black coloration. So the way you can spot them in the sky is that they're white and then they have um, those black wing tips as well. Uh, they have long orange beaks. 
And they also will be flocking together in lakes or bodies of water, um, and they are a water bird. And this is the American white pelican. So um, very big bird that's actually usually here um, during the warmer months. So they come up here around like springtime. Okay, this one, some people might know this one, but leave it open to everyone. Yeah, the white eyebrow marking, absolutely. The red crest, yeah, so. Red crown, yeah, definitely. The crown stripe is very obvious. The eye line, absolutely. It's perched on a tree, that's a really big giveaway. Cool. Um, so yeah, this one's going to be bigger than a robin. It's going to have that red, black, and white coloration and that red crown uh, with the black and white striping on the face, which is um, a good way to identify this one because there's a lot that looks very similar to it. And it's also going to be on the side of a tree uh, pecking at bark, which kind of gives us a good, um, you know, giveaway for that one. This is going to be our pileated woodpecker. Um, the cool thing about woodpeckers is, is that there are actually quite a few that have this coloration. The red, white, and black coloration is really popular with a lot of the woodpeckers in this area um, and in the state of Nevada. So it's really important to look at where those red, white, and black uh, colorations are placed on the body so that you can identify it better. Okay. So next we're going to do this one. Someone said they seem rare to me. Yeah, so once you kind of get out and bird a little bit more, um, they actually, certain ones start to become really obvious and you can identify them better because they'll kind of just be scooting up a tree very slowly and uh, you'll be able to hear them pecking it sometimes. So. Right, yeah, blue green head. So they got that shiny green head, the red eye ring. Yeah, so is it a mullet? Awesome. Yeah, so the um, they got a lot of different colors on them. So that black and white, the brown hanging out by the water. Absolutely. So um, this one, ways to identify, I heard a lot of them. So uh, it's between a robin and a crow size. Uh, it's a glossy green color on the head with the orange and brown colors, as well as that red eye, which I didn't really put in there, but the red eye is very distinctive for this species. Um, it's found swimming in a pond usually. And it's also got that, um, it's almost kind of has a painted look, which is very, uh, you know, um, trademark for this one. So this is going to be a wood duck. And a uh, wood duck is actually one of my favorite birds. So very cool. All right, and this is our last one that we'll do. Um, so some of our Southern Nevada friends might know this one right away. Yeah, that long tail feather is hard to miss. Um, that crested head, absolutely. Long beak, yeah, definitely, so. Perfect, so this one, let's go over this one. All right, so this one's about crow size. About the same size, yeah. Um, they have dark brown and light brown coloration. They have distinct long lifted tail feathers and crests. And then they also have that very unique striping on the breast. And they're usually gonna be found in the desert, open desert or residential areas, um, just kind of hanging out, uh, running along the street and running into gardens and whatnot. And this is actually a roadrunner. So some people who might live in Southern Nevada, this is a pretty common bird that runs around, um, especially in those dry climates. <laughs> 
Awesome. So um, in addition, we have a number of really awesome resources that I especially love to use. Um, one of them is the Audubon Bird Guide app. Um, this one's great for uh, looking for other people's, um, I guess what they've had observed in the area. And there's over 800 species of North American birds listed in there. And you can actually enter the description of the bird and get a list of possible matches. Uh, my favorite one to use is the Merlin Bird ID app. This is the one I live by. Uh, it's great, it's free. Um, you can uh, identify any bird off of it. It asks five questions to narrow down the ID. So it's gonna ask the colors, the size, your location, um, what it's doing, and then maybe like what behaviors it's doing as well um, and what time of year it is. So it'll ask those five questions. Um, and it actually just updated. So it's over 7,500 bird species. So it has gone worldwide as an app. Um, it used to just be North America and be limited to like 400 species, but now it's uh, over 7,500. So you can download different packs. So if you're traveling to a new country or a new part of the uh, new part of our country, you can download a pack for that region that you're going to, which is awesome. Um, and then we have a couple citizen science apps. So the eBird app, which is where you can submit your observations from all over the world and also locate where other birds might be from people's observations that they might submit. Um, and it's also really good for backyard bird count. And then also the hummingbirds at home one. So if you're one of those people that has a lot of hummingbirds near you, um, you can use the uh, hummingbirds at home app to uh, record those observations as well. And then uh, take pictures of the planters that they might be feeding on and what plants that they might be uh, around and document that as well. So that's a really awesome resource that I love to use. Okay, and with that being said, thank you so much for coming to this program. I hope that you learned a little bit more about birding today. Are there any questions that haven't been answered already? So someone said, I've heard that starlings are only birds that exhibit the murmur behavior. Is that true? Are there others? Um, and it looks like actually Julie just answered that question. And to answer that question for everybody else, uh, she just said, I'm not sure. So I'm also kind of not sure. Um, star starlings are very unique with their murmurs, um, but there are a lot of birds that uh, fly in huge flocks like that, um, not limited to, um, there are some different types of starlings in the same family um, and some that are in, uh, I can't remember the name of the bird right now, but um, there are like a lot of different ones that exhibit similar behavior, but maybe not quite the same as a murmur. All right, and then what are some careers jobs that you can utilize birding knowledge with? So um, one that I'm doing right now is I'm working with AmeriCorps and I'm actually, um, uh, part of the education team. So I work with educating the public and also, um, you know, uh, students as well on just wildlife and biology in general. I believe that with birding knowledge, you learn a lot about the biology of the bird as well. And you learn about its ranges. Um, we actually do need a lot of people to go out and do citizen science for us as well. And one thing that's also super helpful is if you have your bird knowledge, you could be a great um, game biologist for waterfowl. So um, waterfowl game biologists actually do a lot to help um, our populations be successful during the hunting season and also to make sure that, you know, we're not doing anything with their um, habitats or we're not decimating their populations too terribly or anything like that. So uh, definitely a lot of places to use your birding knowledge. And um, yeah, let's see, what birding events or uh, groups can I join? I'm new to birding and new to Carson City. So I actually am a part of a group on Facebook called Birding Nevada. And I love it because people post in there every day and they kind of mention their, um, like what they uh, observe and where they observe it at and they'll post pictures. So if you're a photographer and you may like, you know, go out and find some birds, you can definitely post about it. Um, that's usually what I see. But other than that, there's also lots of, you can go on Reddit and ask birding questions there as well. And um, I do believe that there are certain birding foundations within Carson City and Reno as well. Um, some good areas to go to, I would recommend Washoe Lake is really awesome. Um, I love Washoe Lake. Um, also going down to Genoa, there's some great hiking trails up in Genoa that have some really great uh, viewing of raptors and other forest birds. So like our mountain bluebird 
and whatnot. So um, there are lots of great recommendations for Carson City. Mm. Yeah, and the, uh, Julie said the Lahan Audubon Society covers the Reno Carson area. So definitely check out your local Audubon Society if you are curious about um, birding opportunities or just how you can donate or help or anything like that. But, um, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And if you have any additional questions, um, you can email, um, let's see, uh, Julie, probably jwatson at endow.org or me, I'm endow2.americorps at gmail.com. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining and I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening. And thank you all for coming.